Ms. Dawn Seymour was one of America's first female military pilots as a member of the Volunteer Women's Auxiliary Service, known as Women Air Force Service Pilots, or WASPs. Throughout World War II, she flew approximately 700 hours in the B-17, all before the age of 27. Seymour grew up in a lively family of seven children in Pittsburgh, New York, where she enjoyed playing baseball, tennis, swimming, ice skating, skiing, and sailing. She earned her Bachelor of Science degree in economics from Cornell University in 1939. That autumn, she became the first woman accepted in Cornell's civilian pilot training program, where she earned her private pilot's license in 1940. When Japan attacked Pearl Harbor on 7 December 1941, Seymour knew she wanted to be as close to the action as possible. So, after receiving two requests to join the WASPs, she reported to Avenger Field in Sweetwater, Texas to complete primary, basic, and advanced flight training in the PT-19A, BT-13, BT-15, AT-6, UC-78, and AT-17 aircraft. Seymour graduated initial pilot training earning her silver wings with class 43-W-5. Upon graduating from initial pilot training, she was among the first 17 women selected to train on the four-engine B-17. Following her training, Seymour was assigned to Second Ferry Command, Wilmington, Delaware, and then received orders to report to 1174th Flight Operations at Lockburn Army Air Base, Columbus, Ohio. Seymour was one of the lucky 13 who graduated from the B-17F and B-17G combat training course and received her four-engine rating and instrument card. She later went to the Florida Everglades to help train gunners for the D-Day invasion and duty in the Pacific Theater. On 20 December 1944, Seymour, along with the other WASPs, received a letter from General Hap Arnold announcing the end of the WASP program. In January 1946, she returned to Rochester, New York, where she worked for her family business as a manufacturing executive, raised her son, Bill, and became a community volunteer. Ten years later, she married Mort Seymour and later had four more children. In 1972, Seymour attended her first WASP reunion in Sweetwater, Texas, and later served as president of the organization from 1982 to 1984. In March 2010, Seymour, along with over 250 surviving WASPs, was awarded the Congressional Gold Medal for her outstanding contributions to the United States during World War II. Air Command and Staff College is proud to honor Ms. Dawn Seymour as an Eagle. Ms. Seymour, thank you so much for being here and sharing your stories about the Women Air Force Service Pilots. Well, thank you, uh, Rachel. I am absolutely overwhelmed and exuberant at, this, at the uh, welcome you've all given me and our, my fellow male patriots. It's been outstanding and it's warming the heart and I'm telling you, I, every day I hear, I, get, I lose 10 years. <laughs> so I feel younger and more and more exuberant. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. So let's start at the beginning. How did you become interested in flying? It's, a, it's quite a story, actually. Uh, I was teaching at Cornell and after I graduated, and I was, it, it was, my life was not active enough. I had been very active in undergraduate work. And so I saw this sign that said, Please, would you like to volunteer for a health study? And I signed my name. And through that, I opened a door and became uh, the, instruct, the um, professor in charge of the program 
had recently been, been uh, appointed director of flight research. This is 1939. Seven universities in the co company, country had uh, expressed interest in the program. And they were trying to find a way you could pick a pilot without going through ground school and flight school. In other words, a quick way to summarize, you know, who's a good pilot, who's good, what qualities do you need? And so I said, sure. And Dr. F Richard Parmenter was in charge, and he happened to be a World War I pilot. And he said, uh, would you be interested in the program? And I said, yes, but I've never been up in the air. So he said, let's go. And he took me to the Ithaca Airport. And on a golden October day, we soared in a Piper Cub, a yellow cub, through the sunbeams of the sky. And I was just overwhelmed. This love of flying is, is the thread it started me to continue. And fortunately, I had the opportunity after I received my private pilot's license to join this new program that Jackie Cochran had started in Sweetwater, Texas. So how did you learn about this new program, the WASPs? Well, I had Jackie Cochran. I received my private license in, in May of 1940. And in 41, just be, this is probably May or June, I had received in the mail an invitation to a cocktail party at Jackie Cochran's apartment in New York City. I was unable to go. And, but she had culled through the records of the CAA, the Civil Aeronautics Authority, and had found my name. And I was on a list, which is the important thing. You're on a list. And that's how it happened. Then, then, of course, then I had a, a telegram saying uh, to meet the recruiting officer at the Hotel Roosevelt in New York City for an interview. And at the interview, it was interesting, I, uh, the uh, Ethel Sheehy said to me, well, you know, you're, you look like a fine specimen of womanhood, and I'm sure you'll pass the six, Army 6'4. Six, uh, we have an opening in the May, March class. But now here it is, the 5th of March, and the class starts at the end of March. And I thought, would I be ready to go? It's what an opportunity. She said, well, you could join the April class if you wish. No, I said, I flipped a nickel. Had so I go. So I found my way to uh, resign my job, and uh, on my way I went. So you were on your way to Sweetwater, Texas for... Yeah. For yeah. basic flight training, can you tell us about yeah. Sweetwater, Texas? Sweetwater, Texas, 200 miles west of Fort Worth. It's absolutely the wildest country you've ever seen, and the wind doth blow. <laughs> <laughs> so we were all very able, uh, able to make crosswind landings. It was a great experience. But to go back to my training as a private pilot, I soloed on skis, and uh, was, so it was unexpected. And we had to take hot water to de-ice the, the uh, skis from the frozen earth. That was a thrill. I was so excited to be able to, to take off and, uh, and land in this beautiful country. So the training in Sweetwater was quite rigorous. Oh, the training in rigorous was, was rigorous, and the ground school was rigorous. The only thing was that um, uh, there was this undercurrent that you might wash out. A third of the girls washed out of the program. 25,000 women applied, 1,830 were accepted, and 1,074 graduated from the Sweetwater program. Um, you do the math. I think it's about right at a third. So, and when you washed out, You'd come home, the, your bay mate, six to a room, uh, would find the mattress of the girl who washed out, folded over, all of her belongings were gone, no note, nothing. She just simply evaporated. And she was whisked away to the, the Blue Bonnet Hotel, and um, 
we heard nothing about it. And that sort of an idea of being sent home was not exactly acceptable to me. <laughs> <laughs> so after this rigorous training, you graduated from basic training in Sweetwater. What was that like? Um, from basic training? From basic training, your graduation ceremony. Oh, that basically, don't forget we had an advance. Oh, and your advance, yeah. too. It was exciting. It was a hot day. It was September 11th of 1943. Uh, Jackie Cochran was, was, gave me my wings. She wore a flowered dress. She wore sandals and a broad-brimmed straw hat. And when she presented my wings, she gave them to me in my left hand, and I shook her right hand. And the wings were cold. And I said, I did it. I finished. <laughs> It was a wonderful moment. And what did your family think about you flying military aircraft? Well, my dad was very interesting. I said, I know I don't have to get permission because I'm over 21, but I'd like to know your thoughts. And he said, well, if you think you can do it, then I'm all for you. And mother said, how thrilling. <laughs> <laughs> so. so after Sweetwater, where did you go next? After Sweetwater, I thought I'd be a ferry pilot. I was sent to Second Ferry Command in Wilmington, Delaware, and had two weeks of, it was a rainy September, and I learned to, had a check ride in a PT-19A, which is the primary plane, open cockpit and so forth. And um, uh, I was there for just two weeks and received orders to report immediately to Lockburn Army Air Base in Columbus, Ohio, and packed my car up, went across the Allegheny Mountains, uh, arrived at Columbus, Ohio, and found over 180 B-17s on the, on, the, on the field. What a thrill for going to fly a B-17. And sure enough, uh, we were in the 1174th Squadron, and Freddie Wilson, who's the colonel and the CEO, said the day or two before, he'd received a telegram say, expect 17 wasps. Um, they, uh, they, are, they are your new trainees. And he said, oh my god, what am I going to do with all these women? <laughs> he said, and later he told us, oh, I know what I'll do, he said. I will, uh, uh, I'll have my married instructors uh, be their instructors because they know how to handle women. So, <laughs> and uh, sure enough, our our instructor was Logue Mitchell, uh, and he had been training Canadian pilots in the B-17, and he could just come back to the states. He he said to his wife that night that he had the first class. He said, uh, "I'm going to get every girl through." And he was that positive and that uh, persistent. And, and he realized that women did learn to fly differently than men. L women wanted to prove to themselves that they could fly. They could do it. They, they knew how. Whereas men might have had other motives. But he, he liked teaching the women. And he had a trick. This is now we're getting into cold weather up north. and. Uh, He'd send us out to do the, the pre-check of the airplane. About three or four of us would go in, in one training uh, mission. And uh, he'd have us go out and check things over the outside and inside the cockpit. And then he'd come out. And we finally realized that we were warming the seat for him. It was this cold. <laughs> There's no heat in the, in the B-17. It's a big airplane. And uh, uh, the very first time I'm a student, I'm in the left seat, he's in the right. And all of a sudden, and during, the, during the course of the flight, the number three engine caught on fire. And fortunately, I'd read the, the, the uh, manual, and it was, we, we were all turning switches, cutting off things, putting the cow flaps up, punching the emergency fire extinguisher, and the fire was out. And I said to my, we had trimmed, we had trimmed it, so it flew straight and level. And I said, oh, this is the airplane for me. <laughs> and it was so dependable. You, the pilot sat even with the propellers. 
So you could see what was, what was going on with the engines. You had the cowl flaps, which are air intake around the engine, and, uh, and you had to learn how to handle four, four engines at one, t one time. Now, I have a good ear, so I'd not, I could measure up the uh, uh, instruments to where they're supposed to be, and then I'd hear a, oh, oh, you know, a little rumble, and I could tweak the engines and get it to purr. Uh, it was, it was not a fast airplane, it was cruised around between 180 and 220, uh, but that was a lot better than an AT-17 uh, that we trained in, in advanced flight at Sweetwater. So it was a wonderful experience. We, had, we lived in the nurses' quarters, and um, uh, it flew mornings, afternoons, and the next day would be evenings. So we were flying, and then the, Ground school would be uh, the other time of the day. We had PT, we marched to class, we had a full colonel, marches to the flight line in our class. Um, it was serious, and, uh, and here we were, women, on an army base for the first time on the flight line. And we uh, had no real uniforms. Uh, we, we would go to officers' stores and buy, uh, either they were suntans, perhaps if it was warm weather, or greens and pinks, and uh, we must have looked rather tacky. Jackie had these beautiful uniforms made with Santiago blue cloth, and she had half Arnold uh, approve of it before. The other choice was the army drab gray, uh, greens. And he chose the Santiago blue, which is the basis for the Air Force color today. She was a great, great person. If it hadn't been for Jackie Cochran and for Hap Arnold, General, it was called Commanding General of the Army Air Forces, uh, his, his um, interest in us, uh, we wouldn't be have had the experience, I'm sure. And there was another general, Yelt, who uh, was in charge of the training command, and he was gung-ho for the WASP also. So he, she, Jackie had power where she needed it, but she didn't have the power she needed in Congress to fund our program. So we can go on that later. <laughs> so throughout the war, you moved I, around a lot. Oh, I did move around a lot. After we graduated, Oh, our CO at, at uh, Freddie Wilson at Columbus is a graduation present, gave us a silver dollar with Sweetheart Ross, uh, Air Force Wings soldered on the other side. Uh, I think we were accepted, and 13 of us graduated from that program. We did do, uh, uh, we had night uh, flight, we got our instrument rating and four engine certificate. We went to Wright Patterson. We flew up there one day to go through the oxygen chamber and learn what happens when you don't have enough oxygen. Yeah, we each had a pad and a pencil, and you'd write some story or some line, your name, address, and then it, it, you'd nothing. You know, you'd wake up and here it would be off the page. Your pencil was off the page. I think we went up to 38,000 feet in that time, and we did touch 43,000 feet on our oxygen certificate. So one of the requirements was in the Air Force was oxygen mass at 10,000 feet. <laughs> <laughs> so where else did you fly? I didn't where else did you fly throughout well, the Well, after, after uh, we were trained B-17 pilots, Five of us were sent to the Everglades, and, um, and this is a called a Buckingham Army Air Field. A field is just a temporary operation. A base is like Maxwell Field. Base we had permanent housing and beautiful, you know, old trees and uh, whereas a field had you were in the sunshine and uh, it's stark. And you had to make, of course, we had to make our own entertainment, too. Uh, in it, um, 
Buckingham, we were assigned rooms in the civilian dormitory and uh, barracks. And we slept under, uh, we had cots, and slept under mosquito netting. Mosquitoes were a troublesome thing. And uh, you'd, you'd be on a date, and you'd, of course we didn't wear stockings. Uh, we tried, some of the girls even painted a black line in the back of their legs to look like stockings. We got tan, of course. And, um, and then uh, we, we had 23 mosquito bites one night, I counted. And I didn't touch them, I didn't scratch them or anything. The next morning, they're gone. <laughs> this is, now this is a flexible gunnery school. And there were thousands of young boys, 18, 19, 20 years old, who were training to be gunners for the build up for D-Day. And, and because we wore these peculiar mixed up uniforms, We'd have whistles and, and calls and uh, who are these women on the base and so forth and so on. Um, and then of course that settled down. The, uh, the, the men who were the pilots at the time were, were respectful and uh, they found out that yes indeed we could fly the B-17 and yes indeed we were good at it. And yes, indeed, we were determined to help win the war. Um, and that was fine. We flew two missions, uh, one mission a day, between 6 a.m. and 12. And then the next day would be uh, 12 to 6 p.m. Um, we had, a, the gunnery instructor was on board. Yeah, the, Students fired live ammunition from the 50 caliber machine guns posted in the top turret and, the, and in, the wing, in the fuselage side wing, windows. They had a, a steel bar to protect the, um, to go back, the B-26 would, would tow the target let it out over that we were over the Gulf of Mexico as our range from Sanibel Island to Marco Island. And at Sanibel Island, you'd rendezvous with your B-26 at the posted time, and then you go down range. And the gunners were supposed to hit the target, which is a cotton sleeve that's dragged behind the big airplane, the B-26. Well, actually, there are A-23s of strip B-26. Um, and uh, once in a while, they had tracers, of course, and so you could tell where the tracer went too close to the aircraft. Uh, it, I had 30 hours, perhaps, in the, B, in the B-26, and I loved it. Um, it was a fast airplane, maneuverable, quick on the controls, and it landed like a, well, what, how to describe it? You got to the end of the runway, you cut, chopped the props, and you landed on the numbers. It just dropped like a rock. And it was just a wonderful aircraft. I had a chance to fly a B-24 that was visiting the field and thought, what a terrible airplane. <laughs> <coughs> the, uh, uh, the, we, there's always been a nice little conversation between the B-17 and the B-24 pilots. Because the B-17, let's face it, is the last of the tail draggers and it had that big tail, that wide fuselage, and it was a tough one to land in, the, in a crosswind. Um, but I loved it. Everything next. So after and I finished, the t I could do the, I could do go through the, um, the, the mission if you want me to. From splash, the idea was to teach the gunners how to fire a gun from a moving, a uh, moving base to a moving target. And we, you'd, go, you'd skim the water of the Gulf, and hit, hit the water would hit the bur the bullets would hit the water, and then you'd try to hit the, the uh, splash on the water. We did, we did have what's known as um, 12 o'clock high exercises, and we flew by Page Air Force Base, which is located, field actually, it's a field, small. And uh, the P-39s would come up, and now the gunners put um, um, 
film in their guns. And uh, they would practice 12 o'clock high, you know, coming at different angles so the gunners could have different popes. I did fire a beast, a P, uh, the 50 caliber, and it had a kick to it. Uh, it was good interesting. The, um, nothing exciting happened in terms of, uh, of adventuresome thoughts there. But uh, one day the, uh, the 50 cal gun did jump its course and caught the poor gunner right on the nose. And we, I gave him first aid and we called the ambulance and went in. Uh, we called it the meat wagon. Isn't that a terrible term? <laughs> And they met us there. So throughout the WASP program, you did lose some WASP pilots. Pardon? Throughout the WASP program, you did lose quite a few WASP oh, pilots. Oh, yes. We lo during the war, we lost 38 women pilots. 11 were, lo were killed at Sweetwater, an area around Sweetwater, in training. And 27 were lost in the service. Various reasons. Uh, in, in 1996, after a great deal of research, in fact, I came here to uh, the base here at Bexel Field for research We've, uh, to accumulate information about the girls and their history. Um, the book, we had published a booklet called In Memoriam to the 38 Women Who Lost Their Lives in World War II. And one was a, um, a dear, my buddy, her name was Peggy Seip, and she was flying at the end of uh, training to finish up her time with her instructor and with another wasp. And um, for some inexplicable reason, on a CAVU day, uh, the plane crashed and uh, they lost all lives. But before she had died, she had, had planted a garden uh, alongside the wall of the barracks and watered her faithfully. And on the day we graduated, September 11th, 1943, the garden was in full bloom. And I like to think that 30 years later, when the first women c continued in the flying military planes, that. Uh, the seeds took that long to ripen and flower with this new generation of women pilots. And you can be very proud of your women pilots. You can be very proud of your own male pilots. You can be very proud of the people who support the, the, the um, Air Force. I think you are probably, I'm full of optimism that the war Somehow we'll find the secret way to get along with people and uh, stop sh killing people and destroying things. Build things up, why destroy? So I'm hopeful on that. And that's my, my dream, I think, for that. So all of the women Air Force service pilots had a special bond. Can you describe that bond oh, that you had? we had a special bond. I, we only knew, just face it, you're... you're you have a squadron, you have a, a group of people in a bay, six girls, you have a small group going up to, to the flight line, you have a small group going to the PT, their canteen or the, you know, food. and uh, you only knew a few people actually, but you knew after the war we bonded, we had reunions and uh, uh, and you were instantly connected. You'd been through the same training, more or less, and uh, you were wasps, and you uh, had that sense of fellowship, and they were your buddies. So it's a marvelous experience to this day. If th there was a big reunion at Sweetwater last weekend weekend before last, and uh, 15 was attended. Uh, not, uh, that's a good number. I think we're around 100 now. And uh, our stories are, 
being told by the younger girls, 18 classes, and the younger girls graduated in December of 44, December 7th. They didn't have much service time. And so they're carrying on the tradition, but the women military aviators are strong, healthy, and uh, carrying on with their stories. And as you all are here to hear stories, it's all part of our heritage. It's great. So you mentioned in December 1944, those WASPs did not have very much time in service. No. And that was because the WASP program And that's ended. why I was so lucky to have chosen 43-5 yeah. in that class in March rather than April. <laughs> because only a few of us were able to walk through that door for advanced training. Jackie Cochran wanted not only to have a girl fly a, a unique aircraft, but she wanted a group of women. She, her point was to prove that a group of women could fly the P-51, could fly the B-17, the B-25, the B-26, uh, P-47, P-38. Um, uh, and she proved it. And that's to her everlasting credit. Jackie Cochran was an interesting person. Uh, she had many, she was a record setter in aviation in the 30s. And her buddies and, and uh, competitors were Hap Arnold, Jimmy Doolittle, and so forth. So she knew the, uh, she'd flown with them, against them in races. And of course, this was the last part of the golden age of aviation. Aviation, this, this, I, uh, are we ready for go on? Or what? Sure. You got another question? <laughs> I'm giving you too much history, aren't I? <laughs> no. Uh, this space is interesting to me because after the war was over in December, I was, you know, let go, shall we say. Uh, I was sent here with my husband uh, as a wife, and uh, we had uh, we lived in the, mar the married officers' quarters, and, and he was in B twenty nine school, which was here at that time. And we the the whole base, I'm sure, moved downtown on the August day of 1945. When, when Japanese declared surrender. Uh, and it was also a part by a base where pilots and, and enlisted men and so forth were uh, disbanded from the service. And it was an interesting time. Um, we thought we'd stay in the service and then we, had, had made no decision to, to get out. So I was here, and, um, and our friends kept leaving. And it was, all of a sudden, it was a whole different situation than it had been during the war. And everybody went their own way and picked up their own lives as best they could. Uh, I was talking to our young man who's in charge of the uh, officers club today. And I was telling him that we had dances uh, during the year, formal dances. Girls wore long evening dresses. Everybody, you had to make your own fun. There was no television, no, no, communica no computers, or no little boxes. And, uh, and you, so you planned events. It was great. So let's fast forward about 60 years. Okay. Okay. <laughs> what did it feel like when you, were, when you received the Congressional Gold Medal? Oh, my goodness. Congress is, you know, an interesting body of men representing us. <laughs> Women. Congress in June of 44 decided that we were that we they wouldn't fund our program anymore however any girl who was accepted and was in flying status in Sweetwater could stay and that 
to the pro their time was up. Congress in 1977, when uh, the other women started to fly, and they said they were the first women, and then suddenly uh, our group became interested in our history, um, had a caveat on their bill to make us veterans. They made us veterans, but not, uh, honest to goodness, um, Air Force personnel. Army Air Force. Oh no, it's 47. So it'd be, it'd be Air Force. So they little waffled there. So we jumped from being a volunteer into the service to a volunteer into the veterans organization. And then the gold medal comes along as a piece of cake after 30 some years. Uh, well, 2010, you had me, you you're right, it's over 50. And suddenly, uh, again, we're still veterans. We're still volunteers, veterans, and gold star. So I'm pleased. I, I was thrilled. I did several interviews at the time. And uh, here we were. We had grandchildren. Some people had great-grandchildren. They had sisters and brothers. And it, the Congress was overwhelmed with pick people. It was the biggest audience they'd ever had for a ceremony in the uh, House of Congress. Um, it was uh, muted. It wasn't joyful. It was that sense of deep satisfaction that, yes, your country has recognized your service. And I think that satisfaction is um, kind of warming to the heart. I didn't tell you the other moment of, of, uh, of um, that was particularly interesting to me. It was when I did the night, first night solo in the B-17. And I'm making the pattern. And the, the beacon is going around its slow, steady circle. And the blue runway lights are calling. and. And all of a sudden, I realized I was a pilot. It was that same feeling of satisfaction that you'd accomplished something. And I think that's given me um, a sense of strength all my life. And, uh, and I'm so glad to be invited here today, because I really appreciate this moment with you all. So with that, what was your favorite part about flying? I love the sky and all its changes. We had a night flight uh, one time when we didn't have enough time in Columbus, Ohio to graduate. And they, the, the powers that be decided we'd go to Houston to get better weather. And so we were in this terrible weather. The, the ice boots, they're, they're rubber boots, they're called, that are on the leading edge of the wing. And they would take the ice and crack it so it didn't build up ice. And then the propellers had a de-icer machine. They would keep the propellers from getting ice. And that ice from the propellers would hit the fuselage and make this real crashy noise. And all, we were in the soup there for a long time. And all of a sudden, we broke through the clouds and we're up above on the top of the, of the uh, uh, overcast. And there's white clouds. There, it was completely flat. And there's the full moon. Oh, just gorgeous. And it's, I have many memories. The coast of Florida in the afternoons, and perhaps here in Alabama, uh, is lined in the afternoon with thunderstorms, just isolated unit storms. But they're, they're dangerous because they, they can go up 40,000 feet, and they're full of currents of air and so forth. And you, but, but you can fly around them. And, and there's only maybe two in a row before you get to dry land again. And here's the ocean, or the Gulf, and so forth. And as you round about one of these towers, all of a sudden you see the pilots cross which is a complete circle of rainbow with your airplane shadowed in the middle. Oh, it's absolutely stunning. And uh, this world is so beautiful that I, uh, I still to this day, 
when the wheels leave the runway, I have, ooh, <laughs> I'm thrilled. All right, ma'am, we're almost out of time, so I wanted to give you the opportunity if there was anything else that you would like to tell the students. Oh. It's a, it's a wonderful life. And you have so many people to thank. Because you don't, you don't do it alone, you do it through the, through the kindness of other people. I'd never have gone to Cornell unless my Latin teacher had said, you must go pack your suitcase, here's $50, Harriet will drive you down to the Dean of Women, and yet you will find your, your way. Uh, and you must take the step between thought and action, because it's only through action that you are satisfied when you're 99 years old. And I don't think I missed many opportunities, because I guess my goal was to actually to be of service uh, to my country, to my family, to my community, to myself, and to, um, inspire other people, perhaps, that life is wonderful. And be happy, please. Ms. Seymour, you have truly inspired all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me recognize Ms. Dawn Seymour.